How's it going? Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Cubist. My name is Bill Corey. I am The Cubist, and this is the new live streaming rig. We have uh, set up a new camera setup. I tested this very briefly a couple of times a few days ago, but I think I've got it all figured out now, so we're going to give it a try, and we'll see what happens today. So today, I wanted to do something really easy and low complication on the table so that way I could make sure that I didn't have um, too much going on that I wouldn't be able to under, you know, like I just want to be able to focus mostly on keeping the live stream working and everything. But I do have the chat open and I will be paying attention to it. So hi, uh, if you are watching live in chat, uh, it's good to see you. And sorry, I'm, there's going to be a little bit of fumbling around. So any of you that are less than blown away by super polish. Well, I don't know how you ended up on my show anyway, because that's never been the show, but there you go. Why is that not working? Cool. All right, there we go. All right, good, sorry. Wrestling with wrestling with the YouTube thing. Okay, so let's talk about Pinochle. Uh, Pinochle is, everybody in board gaming media right now is talking about Essen Spiel. Um, and Rightly so. It's the biggest tabletop gaming event in the world. Um, and I'm glad that everybody's covering it. I don't want to cover it. I don't want to cover it, A, because we talked about it a little bit on the show on Monday. And B, because I think that I've been a card-carrying member of the Cult of the New for most of my career. And certainly all of the time that I have been a uh, media creator, both back when I was doing audio and now on video. I've been all about chasing new games. And there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes it's fun to go back to your roots. And this is my roots. I would say that aside from role-playing games, Pinochle is probably the first game I ever got really passionate about. So, and I think it still holds up to this day, considering it was apparently, according to BGG, created in 1846... So it is, what, a hundred and, math is hard, 160 years old ballpark, somewhere around there, 170 years old. It's an old game. So let's talk about how it works. So real quick, let's switch to the overhead camera. Um, let me see, make sure that I know how to do that. Hey, look at that. All right, look, I'm almost like I know what I'm doing. Yeah, and this is why I said I wanted to start with a game that was really light on components. So you're going to get a lot of the view of the top of my head. Let me see if I can adjust that a little bit so you get at least a little bit more of it. Okay, and this way I can look up like I'm talking to you. All right, so you'll notice that I'm holding a regular deck of cards, except for it's not really a regular deck of cards. And this is the first thing that... Um, I'm going to get rid of that. This is the first thing that you need to know about Pinochle is that it is not played with a standard deck of cards. It is a classic card game, but it doesn't use a typical 52 card deck. Instead, it uses a Pinochle deck. And a Pinochle deck is basically two of every card from ace down to nine. So nines, tens, jacks, queens, kings, and aces. Um, you will also notice that uh, the tens, I have this deck already sorted uh, in descending order by suit. And you'll notice that the tens are between the aces and the kings. And that is another peculiarity of Pinochle. And probably the thing, one of the things that people have the hardest time remembering is that they're, the tens are the second highest card in any given suit. And I don't have any good answers for you as to why that is the thing. I just know that it is. I'm going to put that back. There we go. Because I want to be able to look at you guys every once in a while. All right. So anyway, so uh, a pinochle deck is, again, two aces, two tens, two kings, two queens, two jacks, and two nines of each of the four suits. So you can make your own pinochle deck at home with two regular decks of cards, uh, just stripping out everything eight and two through eight. Um, so take any two decks of cards that are the same size, of course. Um, if you want to be able to use these decks again for other card games in the future, I would strongly advise getting two decks that have different colored but the same size backs. However, Pinochle purists will yell at you for playing with one of those because theoretically there is a small amount of, amount of card counting that you can do if you can tell that somebody only has blue cards left in their hand and they've played red cards and so on and so forth. So 
you are really better off going and just buying a pinochle deck and be done with it. And the good news is pinochle decks are not particularly expensive because cards aren't particularly expensive. Um, as a matter of fact, I looked on Amazon and I believe there is a 12 pack of pinochle decks for like nine bucks or something like that. So it's pretty cheap. Anyway, my point is in a pinch, you can definitely make your own. So the way that pinochle works is there are four basic parts of every hand of Pinochle. Pinochle is essentially a trick-taking game. Um, it is really a game, it, it, it has its roots in a lot of other classic trick-taking games, things like Euchre, Sheep's Head. Uh, I've heard Pinochle referred to as Poor Man's Bridge before, and I think that's a reasonably accurate uh, nickname for it, and you'll see why when we talk about how the game plays. But basically, when you're playing Pinochle, there are four basic parts of every hand of cards. And I'm going to, by the way, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to assume that you know the basics of how trick-taking games work, where everybody plays one card. This is not a ladder climbing game. This is a regular trick-taking game. So I'm going to assume that you know the, reg the, the specifics of trick-taking, and I'm going to assume you know the, you know what, I won't even assume the idea of Trump. Um, but this is a game that involves Trump suits so and there are a lot of games that use that so if you don't know what that is we'll walk through that in the next minute or so but there are four phases of every hand and then you're going to play a number of hands until a preset score has been reached usually it's 250 oh and it should bear mentioning that there are a lot of variants to pinochle pinochle is an old game and as such it has been played in a lot of different ways by a lot of different people so I'm going to be teaching you the way that I was taught when I was a kid and the way that I have always taught people moving forward. Now, I know that there are a lot of groups that will play Pinochle differently than the way that I play it. And I would strongly advise that if you want to really do a deep dive into it to uh, look up an official rule set anywhere, because I know for a fact that the way that I was taught how to play Pinochle is different from the way that like the Hoyle and Bicycle books would tell you how to play Pinochle in a couple key points and I will try and point them out and I will explain why I continue to play the way that I was taught besides just nostalgia. So anyway, every hand of Pinochle has four phases besides the deal. Uh, random dealer is chosen for the first hand and then deal pr progresses clockwise each hand player to the left deals. Uh, there is no, uh, there can be a missed deal if nobody bids but that's not very common. Um, I know some people that play screw the dealer, which means that the person that deals has to bid the minimum if nobody else bids. There's nothing wrong with playing that way. We've just never done that. We've just always passed the bid. So anyway, uh, this is a 48 card deck and the entire deck gets dealt out in every hand. So each player is gonna get 12 cards randomly shuffled, of course, from the deck. And then the first phase of the hand begins, which is the bidding. So starting with the player to the left of the dealer, each player is going to bid on how many points they think their team, and that's interesting, this is a partnership game, at typically, and I, oh, let me back up. I am going to be teaching you partnership pinochle for four players. There are variants that can cover all the different player counts, but I would argue this game is best played with partnerships of four. There, Like I said, there are lots of other variants out there, but I'm teaching you partnership four player pinochle. So anyway. Uh, starting with the player to the left of the dealer and partners sit across from each other. So the left of the dealer will be the opposite team of the dealer. Uh, that player can decide whether they want to bid or not. The minimum bid is usually 15. Again, this can be variable depending on who you're playing with. I know a lot of people uh, have higher minimum bids than this, but I have always played with a minimum bid of 15 because it gives room for bidding strategy. We'll come back to that. What you are bidding on is how many points you think your team can score that hand if you have the right to determine what the trump suit is based on what's in your hand. So you look at your hand and figure out what your strongest suit is and then you're bidding as if that was trump. So uh, you start with a bid at 15. All future bids must be increased by at least one. There are no rules, at least the way that I play it and how much you can increase. Although increases of five or more are very typical, especially in lower bidding, it'll usually slow down when you get up there, typical bids will range somewhere in the range of about high 20s to low 40s, depending on the confidence of the bidder. A low 40s hand is a good hand, but not an obscenely good hand. 
and you'll understand why in a minute. So the bidding continues around the table until there's only one bidder left and everybody else has passed. Once you pass in the bidding, you can't jump back in, of course. So uh, then that person, whoever wins the bid, the bid is recorded, and this is important. You have to write down how much the bid is, which team won the bid, and what suit they called as Trump. So that's the first step, is the bidding step. Now, there, like I said, there are bidding strategies. We'll come back to that at the end on ways that you can sort of legally table talk with your partner during the bidding phase to help communicate some basic information about your hand. And this should not be interpreted as actual table talk because it's really just established strategies with well-oiled machine teams. So I feel comfortable talking about them because I feel like if you're going to play Pinochle, Pinochle is one of those games that's great to play with two teams that play often so they get good at it. The better you are at this game, the more you will enjoy every hand because the more strategy you'll be able to dive into. It's a deceptively deep game for just being a 48 card game. So anyway, uh, the bidding team declares what's Trump and that's written down. Then the second phase of the hand begins and this is unique I think to the variant that I was taught, I don't see this in most versions of Pinochle that I'm aware of, but this is definitely the way I was taught, which is the bidding team gets to trade three cards with each other. So how that works is each player on the bidding team, independently, without discussion, takes three cards from the hand and puts them face down on the table, gives them to the other player. Uh, the theory here is that the player that didn't win the bid on the bidding team, so partner, um, will pass three good cards to the bidder, so that way the bidder can have a very strong hand for the next two phases, the third and fourth phases of the, of the um, hand. So that pass happens. Again, you can't look at the cards that you're receiving until you have chosen and passed your own cards, so it is a blind three-card pass. And then once that pass has been completed, we start the third phase of each hand, which is the meld phase, M-E-L-D. Don't know why it's called that. Um, there is an even weirder word for the fourth <laughs> phase of the game. We'll come back to that. But meld, with the meld phase, we're going to go back to the overhead because this is going to be something where it's going to be helpful to be able to show you examples. So I'm going to set a nine of clubs over here as, and rem, as the reminder that let's say the bidding team has declared clubs as Trump, okay? So now I'm gonna lay out all of the different melds. And what melds are, are they are patterns of cards that a player would have in their hand that are gonna be worth points. So think of this as sort of a, a uh, pattern matching hand management part, I guess, um, in that you want specific patterns. The most common pattern and the pattern that most people, and I'm gonna set this actually way over here, so that way it's out of the way, um, the most common pattern that you will see is called a run. And a run is one card of every, or one of each trump card besides the nine, okay? So this only applies to the ace, ten, king, queen, and jack. Excuse me. Ah, oh, the good news about this new rig is I have a sneeze button so I don't sneeze in your ear. Yes. Anyway, uh, a run here, um, again, is only in Trump, and this is worth 15 points. So if you have a run, this is will make your minimum bid. And that's really important. Uh, this is part of why minimum bid is set there and why a bid of in the 20s is not scary, because this is the Trump suit, which means it's going to take tricks very easily when we get to the trick-taking space. And... Generally speaking, you're not going to bid unless you have a pretty strong hand, which will likely involve us a run. And if it doesn't involve a run, your partner is passing you three cards, if you win the bid, to help you fill out that run. And here is the first piece of partnership strategy in the game, is your partner should be thinking about what stuff to send you, so that way you can have a stronger hand, not just for trick-taking, but also for... Uh, melding for melding things like runs. So anyway, the run is the basic most common big scoring meld. A run is worth 15 points. There is also aces around. Okay. Aces around is just an ace of every suit. Oops. And an aces around is worth 10 points. Likewise, 
there's kings around. Kings around is worth eight points. So we're gonna scoot some of this stuff up here and make a little bit more room. There's our run, which is 15. Aces around, which is 10. Kings around, which is eight. Queens around is the next one. The queens around, I bet you could guess if you tried real hard, is worth six. And then jacks around is the last one. Jacks around is worth four points. So these are the most common melds, I would argue, besides marriages. And we'll come back to marriages in a second here. Okay, so there is jacks around. Jacks around are worth four points. So again, a run is worth 15, okay, assuming that clubs are trump. Uh, so this would be 15 points. Note that a run of any other suit is not worth anything, okay? Aces around is worth 10 points, 8 points, 6 points, and 4 points. Now, in all of these cases here, and this is why I started with these particular things, and I'm sorry it's flashing. The white balance is struggling a little bit here. Let me see if I can even that out a little bit so that way maybe that calms down because right now it looks like I'm having a disco party on camera, which is a little bit less than pleasant. Da, 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 da. Come on, you can do it. Of course, yes, I, of course I do. That was why I turned you on. Can we turn that off? Can you stop, please? Oh my goodness. Why are you flashing like that? That's the worst. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, this is, like I said, that's part of why we're doing this test. All right. So anyway, every one of these melds that I have laid out here has a unique property, which is that if you can achieve that meld twice in the same hand, i.e. one player has two aces of clubs, two tens of clubs, two kings of clubs, two queens of clubs, and two jacks of clubs, or one player has all eight aces, or all eight kings, or all eight queens, or all eight jacks, that's a double of whatever that thing is. And a double in pinochle is worth 10 times what it would normally be worth. So a double run is worth 150 points, not 30. Aces all around, when it's in a round, it's usually referred to as all around. So this is aces around. All eight aces would be called aces all around. And that would be worth 100 points, 80 points, 60 points, and 40 points. Okay, other stuff that is a valid meld. Marriages. A marriage, marriage, marriage is the thing that brings us together today. A marriage is the king and queen of any suit. And a marriage is always worth two points unless it is a marriage in the trump suit in which case it's worth four points. So it is literally double the value if it's of trump. So if this was the king and queen of clubs, that would be worth four points. The nine of trump is worth one point. Okay, so a nine of trump is always worth one point. And now this is the other thing that everybody gets wrong. And I can't really blame them for it because it's hard to remember. No matter what trump is, a combination of a queen of spades and a jack of diamonds is always worth four points. That's called a pinochle. This is the thing that everything in this game is named after, theoretically. This is called a pinochle, and this is always worth four points. Okay? So, um, remember how I said that everything is worth double if you have two of them over on this column? This is the other weird one. A pinochle, if you have all four... So you have both queens of spades and both jack of diamonds. That's a double pinochle, but that is not just worth times 10. It's a weird one. It's worth 30 points instead, and I don't know why. So one pinochle is worth four points. A double pinochle is worth 30 points. Don't ask me. I didn't invent it. I'm just teaching you how I know. Okay? So everything that I have here is listed, or all of the things that I have here are your basic melds that you can make. Now, there's a couple notable exceptions that I'm going to point out. First off, you notice that there is no tens around. Tens around doesn't exist in this game. I don't know why. Tens do have a value. First off, they are the second highest card in any given suit. So uh, technically, they are the third and fourth highest card because remember, there's two of every card in this pinochle deck. So um, they are worth something there and they are also worth points during trick taking. We'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. 
The other weird thing about Pinochle, and something that, again, takes people a long time to get used to sometimes, is that in Pinochle, you can use the same card for more than one meld with one very important exception. So I'm going to show you an example here that works, all right? So I'm going to take all of this stuff and just kind of shove it off to the side for right now, okay? And I'm just going to show you this. So if I have these cards in my hand, okay, we are still going to assume, let me just get rid of all of this and we'll just shove all this out, stuff to the side and bring this front and center so you can see it. As a matter of fact, I'll even zoom in on it a little bit here. Let's see if I can do that. Ta -da, ta -da. Thanks for bearing with me, folks. I appreciate it. How does that look? There we go. That's a little better. All right, so now we're going to zoom in a little bit because we're going to be talking about just a couple very specific things. If you have this setup in your hand, and this is just here for reference to remind you that clubs are trumps, so we'll push that way off to the side, okay? If you have this, you have a run, which is worth 15 points. That's the easy one. You also have aces around if you can count this ace from the run, and the trick is in Pinochle, you can. You can use the same card for more than one meld as long as neither of the melds you're talking about, well, I, I'm sorry, you can't reuse, you can't combine a run and a marriage. That's the thing that I was trying to say. Sorry about that. That's a little bit funny. It, it's actually a slightly more involved rule than that, but the basic idea is like, I could not take this queen of clubs here and play this and say, look, I have a run and I have a royal marriage because you already have a royal marriage as part of the run. So you can't do that. But any other combination like this works just fine. So this here would be worth 25 points because you'd have 15 points for the run and 10 points for aces around. And that, of course, applies to any of the other combinations. So for instance, if you had this, you would have a run and queens around. This would be a much less ideal hand for reasons that we'll get into in a minute. But this would be worth 21 points, 15 for the run, 6 for queens around. Let's say, for instance, that spades are trump. Okay, so we'll put up a 9 up there to help remind everybody of that. And let's say you have your meld here. Okay, so you have melded a run in spades. And you also have this. Now you have 19 points because you have a run, which is 15, and a pinochle, which is four more. Now that's important because pinochles in this game sort of link spades and diamonds together. Um, so those will be your pinochle suits or your leg suits. And we'll come back to legs in a second. But the basic idea is that from a strategy standpoint, you're going to want to kind of keep these together because if uh, the bidder is bidding with spades, they might want that jack of diamonds because it'll be an easy four points for their meld because they already probably have the queen of spades because they bid on spades, right? So that's the sort of idea. Um, those suits tend to be linked together when you're deciding what cards to pass your partner. Um, and there are other factors involved and we'll come back to that. So all four players will meld at, during this third phase of the game, okay? All four players will take any cards that they have in their hand that they can form valid patterns out of. Arounds, marriages, runs, generally speaking, that's only the bidding team, but I have seen non-bidding teams be able to meld a run of the Trump suit before, and the look of panic on the bidding team when they see that happen is always fun to watch. Um, anyway, rounds, pinochles, and runs are the three most common things with, of course, marriages and nines of... Nines of Trump, which are always worth a point apiece. I think I mentioned that before. And by the way, I will put in the description for this video, after the video goes live, I will put a link to a cheat sheet that I've created uh, that is basically a one-page Word document that has all of this stuff in it, so in case you get lost and you want to go back and review this later. All right. Anyway, everybody will lay out visibly for all players to see all of the melds that they want to take credit for, and all of that score will be written down on the score pad. Once everybody has determined that all of their melds have been laid out, they all pick those cards back up, and then we start the fourth phase of every hand, which is the trick phase. So now, after all the bidding and the passing and the melding, 
it comes down to a basic trick taking card game okay and so we're going to go back to base game here because and i'll come back to the table in a minute but in a trick taking game uh, again i'm assuming that you know how this works where each player starting with left of dealer by the way always starting with left of dealer at least in the version that i learned um will lead a card every other player clockwise around the table must play one card if they can follow suit, meaning play a card from their hand of the same suit as the suit that was led, they must. If they can't, and this is an important diversion from what I've seen most published rule sets, the way that we always played is that if you can't follow suit, you can play whatever you want after that. You generally will play Trump if you want to take the trick um, because the way that Trump suits work, and Trump in this game is any is whatever suit was called, all cards of that suit will beat all other cards not of that suit. So if spades were trump and you led a club and I don't have any clubs, I could play a spade and now my spade is the highest card on the trick. If all other players after I trump have clubs, they have to still keep playing the lead suit. Only people that can't follow suit can play trump willingly. Um, and if you, are, if you don't want to play Trump, again, the version that I was always taught, you don't have to. I know that most published versions of Pinochle say otherwise. They say you do have to play Trump if you can't, and you must always attempt to take the trick. I have played that way before, um, and honestly, you could really go either way with it. I think it's just as valid both directions. I think it's a little bit more strategic when you don't force Trump. I think it allows for a little bit more choice. Uh, there's already forced um, following suit, so that's already already a thing you have to deal with. It's maybe not, I don't think it's particularly useful to enforce that other rule, but I guess what do I know? Anyway, whoever played the highest card in that set, whichever player played the highest card out of the four, will take the trick and add it to their team's score pile. Now, a team keeps one collective score pile. Sometimes each player will just keep their own and then they'll be combined at the end. doesn't matter where the cards are physically kept as long as you know which team kept the trick. So sometimes uh, it's very common if I am the bidder, my partner will be the one that will actually physically collect all the tricks while I'm taking tricks because theoretically I'm doing the bulk of the card play and the partner is just kind of throwing cards onto, the, onto there because they've theoretically given me all their best cards. Yeah, it's a strategy thing or a, a taste thing. It doesn't really matter. Whoever wins one trick leads the next trick. Rinse and repeat until all four players have played all 12 of their cards over the span of 12 tricks. At that time, the hand ends. And here is the really key part is scoring that trick play. And this is, remember when I said there was one more weird word coming? The word is schmear. And I'm gonna make that up. Schmear, S-C-H-M-E-R-E -E is how it is at least spelled when I've read it. Schmear are the points that you have taken during trick play. Um, most folks nowadays just call it points, but the, the name that I was taught when I was a kid was Schmear. Anyway, uh, the points in, in the tricks, the tricks themselves don't individually matter except for the last trick. Who, whichever team takes the final trick in the hand, that's worth one point. And in addition, all aces, tens, and kings are worth a point apiece. So when you are counting your tricks let's say that these were all the cards that i t that my team took in tricks what i would do is i would literally just go through this big old pile and there's i just kind of threw a random number of cards here and i would just count for aces tens and kings now it is kind of you'll get some heat if you play with real hardcore pinochle players if you sort them i've seen people do this before try to avoid that if you can um, and the reason you want to avoid that is because you don't want to make it so that way the deck is clumped together when it comes time to shuffle for the next hand. And this creates it so all the aces, tens, and kings are together and makes the shuffle a little bit less random maybe. So I'm going to shuffle this really fast so that you can see the right way to count your points. The right way to count your points is to go one because I just flicked off a points card. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Aces, tens, and kings. So that would be thirteen points or thirteen schmear. 
in my team's tricks, okay? You add those points that you just scored here, add those to the points that you scored through your meld, and if that combination of points equals or exceeds your bid as the bidding team, then you get to keep all of your points. If it does not, if you don't make enough points between the two in order to be able to satisfy your bid, then you not only don't get to keep any of those points, but you lose all of the points in your bid. So if you bid 35 and you only score 32 points, not only do you not get to keep any of those 32 points, whether they came from Meld or Schmear, but you also will go back 35 points. So not making your bid, especially if it's a big bid, can really hurt. So one of the things that it's very easy to feel like you got burned hard when that happens to you. And what will often happen is new players will start to get really trigger shy when they get burned on a trick because they feel like, wow, I should bid much lower. And the fact is, in general, if you have even kind of a good hand, you probably will make a 30 bid. Like even if your hand is not spectacular, if your partner isn't an idiot and knows how to pass correctly, then you're gonna get 30 points because you'll probably get the run um, unless you know, you're know you gonna be bidding on a suit that you have a lot of anyway and your partner will probably pass you any of the, of the cards of that suit that they have because they're gonna wanna fill in your run for you. So you'll probably get the run and if you get the run, you'll probably take 15 points in tricks. And the reason why you'll probably take 15 points is because you will have the strongest trick-taking hand because you have all of those trump, which means it'll be very easy for you to take trump. Also, you got to pass three cards away to your partner, which means you were probably able to short suit yourself, hopefully, and get rid of at least one suit, which means anytime anybody else leads that suit, you can play one of your trump. So you're increasing the chances that any given trick you'll be the one that can take it and your partner will be throwing cards onto the tricks he knows you're going to take he or she sorry i'm, I'm trying <laughs> your partner will be throwing cards onto the tricks you're about to take and if partner is throwing point cards onto those kings tens and aces then he's putting points into your point total so just kind of keep that in the back of your head is that it's really easy to be super terrified of that bidding, especially since the minimum bid is only 15. It feels like everybody, when I teach this game, I very often have new players that their bids will be like 21, 22, and they're starting to get nervous because all they're thinking to themselves is, well, if I don't get that run, then I'm going to be in trouble. And the fact is, let's say you bid 25 and you don't get the run. Okay. Let's say that your partner can't pass you the correct card. You just needed the jack and they passed you three other things and so you didn't get your run. You still will probably have a royal marriage, maybe two, you might have aces around and you'll definitely take a bunch of points because you're assumedly still have a pretty strong hand. So like you're gonna be okay. So I would urge people whenever you, you're playing Pinochle for the first time, try not to get too trigger shy on bidding uh, because half the fun is being able to win the bid and and uh, call Trump and make these great combos of aces around and and runs and double pinochles and all kinds of fun stuff. So let's come back to a little bit of strategy. Um, when you're bidding, I, I promised I would explain some of this stuff, so we're going to try for a few of them here. Well, first off, when you're bidding, um, you can increase your bid by as little as one each time. So very often, if you're, let's say your partner opens with 15 and then the, the opponent to your right bids 16, it is tempting to not bid, right? Because your partner is bid and you don't wanna overbid your partner because you, know, you don't want to drive their bid up when you're working on the same team. However, a small, uh, overbid, so let's say built bidding 17, might communicate to your partner that you have a decent hand. Or maybe you might bid 18 or you know two or three over to show that you have a very good hand. And if you really want to take the bid because you are super confident you have a great hand, then you might bid really high, like you might go over and say 20 or something like that. 
And by that sort of a mechanic, you can, this is what I meant by a little bit of table talk, is those small incremental bids across the table can communicate without any cheating whatsoever, I have a really good hand partner. And also maybe don't leave your partner hanging. So let's say I'm left of the dealer, the dealer is to my right and dealt the cards, I'm the first bidder in the hand. If I pass right away, then the person across the table, my partner, is basically stuck bidding up even if they have a terrible hand. Now, if my hand is garbage and I really have terrible cards, then maybe that's still the right play. But you might bid even if you don't have a great hand, just as a bluff to give your partner a way out in case their hand is truly terrible or to just mess with the other players. And this is where I think one of the big parts of strategy of Pinochle comes in and why I like this game so much is because this bidding phase there is a lot of subtle communication that goes on between any player and their partner and watching what the other team is doing while they're bidding can be kind of a big deal. So I really like this first, I, I, I really like this first segment of it. Um, hi Willie, uh, yep, might just be you, but you see a lag between video and audio, audio is faster. Yeah. I, like I said, we're trying this for the first time. It's showing that the stream, right now, everything looks pretty good, at least from what I can tell. Um, on my end, things look good, so it could just be you. I guess I don't know how to answer that question except for to say hello, and I'm glad you're here. So, as a matter of fact, I'm going to shrink this down a little bit more so that way I can see you a little easier. There we go. We'll put that there. There's that. Awesome. All right. There we go. Thanks. Thanks for watching, Willie. All right, so bidding, I think, is the first really interesting strategy point in the game. The second is the pass. This can be what makes or breaks a team. If you are a good passer in Partnership Pinochle, or I, I feel like I want to give this a name because I know that the way that I play Pinochle is weird compared to the official roles, so I almost want to call it like Cubist Pinochle. That's a terrible name, and I don't, I'm don't. i really not going to do that because I'm not that cocky. But... Um, if, you're, if your partner is really good at knowing what to pass, that can really help a lot with the play. So let's go back to the table really fast and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So let's say we're gonna go back to the example where clubs were declared as Trump. Okay, your partner uh, called clubs as Trump. And let's say, I'm just gonna deal myself a random hand of 12 cards. I'm not even gonna look and I'm gonna make this decision live. Thank you, Willie. Appreciate it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay. So this is my 12 cards that I have in my hand. And my partner has picked clubs as Trump. All right. So when you're playing, I don't know if you play, some folks don't sort their cards when they play classic card games. I always do because I never feel like I'm smart enough. All right. So my partner called clubs. And this is my hand of cards. So I'm just going to lay it on the table so that way you can see every card. And hopefully the white balance plays nicely so that way you can actually see everything. All right. All right. In the interest of clarity, I put the 12, or I put the cards that are of the called suit over to the right here. These are the 12 cards that I have. Okay. My partner has called clubs and I have to pass my partner three cards. Okay. So now which cards from here am I better off sending over? The first thing that I would always look at if I was going to pass this is I will pass parts of a run first. So I would pass those two cards because if one of those two happens to be the card that my partner is missing in order to fill their run, this is an easy 15 points to help them get, okay? Now it would be tempting as a third card to also pass them the nine of Trump, right? Because this is another Trump card. This is a great way for them to take another trick. However, a nine of Trump might take one trick, but you know what would be better? Is passing them an ace. Because if you lead an ace that is not Trump, remember, everybody has to follow suit. So, and the other team didn't get a chance to short suit themselves. They had to play with what they got because they didn't get a chance to pass. So the odds of every player at the table having at least one spade are pretty good. So this is probably a guaranteed trick somewhere, whereas a nine of Trump is probably not. In addition, this ace might help them get aces around. Remember an ace of every suit. 
which would be worth another big 10 points. So if you can help them get closer to that 10 points, you're, you're helping your cause a lot more than you might just be throwing that out there. What you would never want to pass out of these cards, the cards that would be the worst ideas to pass, would be any of these four cards. Any of these over here would be a terrible idea. And the reason for that is because, you remember when I said that the pinochle, the queen of spades and the jack of diamonds, and I'm just gonna leave this over here so that way you can see, all right? And I'll put this over to the side and I'll cock it here so that way you remember that this is not a thing. All right, the pinochle, the queen of spades and the jack of diamonds, this particular combination sort of forces these two suits to go together. And as such, it also forces these two suits to sort of go together. So what you wouldn't pass the guy that's ordering up clubs is things of those other suits because the odds are your partner is going to be short suiting in those suits, trying to get rid of them because, again, that's sort of the, the thing. Plus, if you don't pass these, let's say he has this jack of diamonds, they pass it to you, now you have a pinochle. And maybe you had all of these parts and your partner passes you the fourth one because again, they're just trying to get rid of stuff. Now you have a double pinochle in your hand and now you have 30 points you can contribute. So again, the suits sort of go together. So you would try usually to avoid, spades and diamonds tend to go together because of pinochles, okay? And hearts and clubs tend to go together. Now, this is a spade and we're still passing this even though it is not the correct suit because we're thinking about that aces around and trick play here. So it's really a balancing act, okay, on what you pass. Now let's say I didn't have this ace, okay, and let's say I had another, uh, something terrible like this. Like, let's say this was my hand. So here's five, 10, 12. Here are the 12 cards that I now have. If I was doing, if this was my hand and I had to pass something, I would still pass the two parts of the run, but now I might pass that nine because I don't really have anything better to pass because even though tens are the second highest card in the linked suit, right? Clubs and hearts go together. Tens don't typically tend to take tricks because there are two cards higher than them. They sometimes do, but it's not common. So generally speaking, this isn't gonna be a good card to take a trick with. It'll be a point card. And because this is your partner that is going to be theoretically doing the most of the heavy lifting for your team in this hand, you wanna have point cards in your hand that you can put onto your partner's tricks when they take them to get more points home faster. Because your job as partner is, in this case, is the non-bidding partner is to help get the points home and to help them meld well, not to keep stuff for yourself. Now, let's look at another example. I'm gonna choose, I'm gonna change this example a little bit. And let's say these are the 12 cards I have, okay? Now this is a slightly more subtle example, but you'll notice that now I have kings around in my hand. And partner has asked for clubs. So now this is a much tougher decision because I know I'm gonna pass him the jack, that's fine. I don't really have much else to send and breaking up a guaranteed eight points for the chance at 15 points is gonna be kind of a personal call. It really depends on who you are and how you play the game. So in this case, I might do this. And then for my third one, I would throw the queen of, of, of hearts. And that will look weird to partner when, when partner gets those cards and be like, what is this about? But then when you meld kings around, it makes a little bit more sense. The reason that you'd keep that is because these are all point cards. Remember, aces, tens, and kings are worth points in trick play at the end. So you're gonna wanna keep all these point cards so that way you can put them on your partner's tricks. And breaking up kings around is a tough call to make. Breaking up queens around and jacks around, it gets easier as they get worse. I will always break up jacks around as an example because it's only four points. A marriage is worth just as much as that, so. Anyway, so that's the second part of the strategy is learning how to be a good passer. If you are the bidder and you are passing, you're probably passing away things that you don't want. So it's sort of the reverse of what we just said. You're gonna be passing away cards. If clubs are trump, you'll probably be passing away uh, spades and diamonds. 
um, you probably prioritize parts of pinochles first because you know that your partner's gonna hang on to those. So you might pass away pinochles, hoping to get the double pinochle in one person's hand. You'll probably pass away point cards because you know that point cards aren't, don't typically take tricks unless they're aces. And if the if your if the non-bidding partner has those point cards, you can play those point cards on your tricks to help you bring home more points. So it's all about sort of short suiting yourself and setting up your hand for the best meld and the best trick play you possibly can. So that's the second major strategy point is how to be a good passer. Now, of course, if you are not the bidding team, there's nothing for you to do during this phase. If you're the you're the you're the opposing team. You're basically just kind of watching what the what everybody melds because you remember they're going to have to pick those cards back up. So you're going to learn something about their hand during this meld phase, and that's a big deal. That can't be overstated enough. When you if you pay attention, and I actually think this is something that can be extrapolated to most board games, and I don't want to get up on that soapbox today. But if you pay really close attention to what other players are doing at the game table while you're playing a game, you are almost certainly going to play better than if you are idly scrolling through social media on your phone or whatever. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't take pictures of, of things, and I'm not saying that we should put all put our cell phones in a lockbox at the beginning of each tabletop session and never touch them until the game is over. I'm not trying to be that guy. But I will say that if you pay attention and you focus on the game, whether you have anything specific to do in that moment or not, I think you are a better player. And Pinochle is a great example of that. If you are watching the melds that other players are putting down during the meld phase, you're going to learn about what cards they have in their hands. So if somebody, we'll go back to the table here, if somebody melds these kings around again, then you know that they have a king of every suit. That means you know that they are going to be able to follow suit at least once in every suit in this trick, which means they have three what are called fails guaranteed. The fails are cards that are not likely to take tricks. That's called a fail. So anybody with kings around has three fails. They're going to get eight points, but you know they're not going to take tricks with those points. Hi, Chad. How are you? Good to see you. So watching what people meld during this phase of the game is a really big deal because you gain some knowledge into what cards they have which will inform trick play later on and then after everything everybody picks up their cards trick play starts like i said we start with left of the dealer and go clockwise one at a time the person that wins each trick leads the next trick um, when you are playing cards to tricks the idea is that you want to take point cards. Remember, it's not the number of tricks that you take, it's the number of point cards that you take. So if a trick is going by and doesn't have any point cards on it, maybe you don't worry about taking it. Maybe you throw something crappy on there to get rid of a fail. Uh, maybe you take it anyway if you need the lead. And here is the third major point of strategy behind Pinochle and why I like this game so much is during trick play, you are not just worrying about whether you can take every single trick. You are worrying about taking the important tricks that either are gonna get you lots of points for your smear pile at the end of the hand, or are going to get you the lead so that way you can control the rest of the trick play for that hand. And that's a really big deal. Um, so there is our third major strategy point in the game and the third part of why I really enjoy this game as much as I do. Uh, there is a quick rule that I forgot to mention and I always forget to mention and it's not in my cheat sheet so I'm going to update my cheat sheet before I put out the share link which is that if your team does not take any tricks during the trick play portion of the hand your team gets zero points for that hand whether you are the bidder or not no matter how much meld you have you have to take at least one trick across your team in order to get any points for the hand at all. So if you are the opponents, you're the opposite team, and you don't take anything, no matter what you meld, you get zero points for the hand. So you always wanna make sure to try and take at least, your team has to take at least one trick. And I mean, sometimes it won't happen. But generally speaking, if you can't take a trick, you probably didn't score a lot of points in the first place. Um, so it's generally not a super, it doesn't happen real often, usually, you end up taking at least one trick every hand. 
somewhere along. Somebody does. Each team will take one. So anyway, um, at the end of the trick play, each team counts up the number of point cards or schmear that they got in their in their pile of tricks. Remember, aces, tens, and kings count as a point apiece. And the last trick, whoever takes that final set of four cards, that's worth one point also. That means there's a total of 25 points available during trick play. Um, so what will often happen is the team that has the smaller pile of trick will count their points, and then you can just subtract from 25 for the other team. There's really no need for both teams to count. So generally speaking, the team with the smaller pile, usually the opponents, whoever the opposing team is, they will count their tricks, and then the, the leading team will take theirs. And if the bidding team between the meld and the points taken in tricks equal to or exceeded their bid, then they get to keep all the points that they actually scored. If they didn't, they don't keep any of the points they actually scored, and instead they go backwards. They lose a number of points equal to their bid. So again, if you bid 35 and you only take 32 between meld and tricks, you would have a net at the end of the hand of losing 35 points, which is kind of its own special hell, so to speak. And it's very frustrating when it happens. It will happen, especially when you're learning, especially when you're getting used to a new partner. Um, like, as, as I hope I've kind of hinted here, there is a lot of thought that goes into this game. There are a lot of really interesting nuances to Pinochle, at least the version that I was taught how to play. And I know, like I said, there are a million variants for this game. Um, as I pointed out before, sometimes, sometimes, um, I'm going to answer this really fast. Uh, Willie, I'm handling it myself. Actually, here, I'll show you. Watch this. I have a wireless keyboard right here that is just set with hotkeys that is just off, off, scam, off camera. I am not doing it via mouse. I have hotkeys set up for all of my scenes. So this is this scene, and then I have one with just the tabletop, and then I have one with just my face. And then I also have the intro, which I don't know if you caught, uh, but that has the theme music. The theme music is back, and hopefully it'll be back for all of the shows moving forward. So anywho, um, yeah, so the variants. Uh, things that I know other people play differently. I know that there are a lot of tables that play with no passing, where you just got to deal with what you get. I know that there are a lot of people that play with double deck pinochle, where the deck is four of each card, so four aces of clubs, four aces of diamonds. I think that's bananas. I played it, I don't like it. I think it's too hard to develop strategy because there's just too many cards. When you play that way, all the, scarred, all the cards are, or all the scores are um, increased. That reminds me, um, some places you will see the scores always have an extra zero at the end. So like, remember how I said that the nine of Trump is worth one, one point. Um, a lot of people will play where this is worth 10 points and this would be worth 80 points and this is 40 points and whatever. To me, that just feels like unnecessary cognitive load. Why add the zero? So I don't know about that. Uh, let's see. Uh, the biggest one that I think is a difference is the idea that you have to trump. I know that the quote-unquote official rules that I have seen say that you have to trump. I was always taught you didn't. So it's really, that's a variant, and I admit that that's a variant, but I think it's more interesting when you have more free choice on what you can play. Following suit is still a big deal, but I think it's a, it's a better fit when you can make decisions beyond that. I think that one rule is enough, so... That's that. Uh, like I said, passing is, is not always a thing. Um, I have seen a couple melds. Uh, there, there is something called a roundhouse. Um, a roundhouse is a marriage of every suit. So the king and queen, it's basically kings around and queens around. Um, if you have that, that is worth 24 points, but it is worth 24 points because eight kings around is eight points, queens around is six points, that's 14. Then there are three regular marriages, which are worth a total of six points, which brings you to 20, and one royal marriage. That's a marriage of Trump, which is worth four points. It's 24. So kings around and queens around is worth 24 points uh, because, remember, cards can be counted in multiple melds as long as you're not trying to combine a run and a marriage. That's the only thing that you can't do. And I think I mentioned the royal marriage before. I hope I did. Anyway, that's worth four points instead of two. Sorry if I missed that before. Um, Anyway, there's a few other smaller variants than that. You can play the game with three players instead of four. In that case, it's every person for themselves. 
you get dealt 15 cards each and three cards are put into the kitty in the center of the table. Whoever wins the bid gets to switch three cards. They pick up those three cards first, look at them and then discard three and then play. So that's called Cutthroat Pinochle. Um, it's much more challenging because you don't get an informed pass. You basically have to be a lot more sure of what you have. Um, but that can be fun. If you only have three, it's still a fun way to play the game. Uh, there is such thing as two-player Pinochle, but I don't recommend it, and I'm not even going to bother teaching it because I don't think it's fun. It is weird and kind of anticlimactic and sucks. It, it has all of the mechanics but none of the strategy, which kind of bums me out. So I don't really enjoy it much, and I try to avoid it when I can. I'd rather just wait and play something else if I only have two players. So, so anyway... Um, that is Pinochle in a nutshell. I hope that this has taught you what I consider to be the best of the classic card games. And I know that there are a lot of people that love other classic card games. Specifically, Gamerdom has a lot of really passionate cribbage players. I also love cribbage. I've, I have a beautiful cribbage board right up there that I might show off. Maybe I'll do another one of these videos later. Maybe I'll do more classic games because I think there's some really great ones out there that don't get enough love anymore. And cribbage is one that a lot of gamers tend to gravitate towards. Anyway, I know there's a lot of cribbage nuts that are gonna take issue with me calling Pinochle the best of the, of the classic card games, but I would argue that it really is an amazing card game. It brings so much strategy and it's such a fun experience, especially when you get a partner that you really click with and that understands strategy or at least understands it the way that you understand it and plays well such that they play with your strategy and you can form that partnership and just get really good at the game, boy, is that satisfying. When you find a Pinochle partner that you click with, that you can play really strong games of Pinochle with, there's nothing... The only game that I can think of that even comes close to that feeling is Tichu. And I would argue that Pinochle is on a par with Tichu as far as strategy goes, except for I think, it, and it has about the same number of gotcha rules that are hard to remember, right? Like tens come between aces and kings and queen of spades, jack of diamonds is the pinnacle no matter what suit is. So it's sort of like the dragon and the phoenix and remembering all that stuff. But yeah, it's really good. Um, you can get, like I said, if you have two regular decks of cards at home, you can make your own pinnacle deck or you can just order one. I would strongly recommend just buying one. They're cheap. You can get them at any big box store. They always sell them. At least around here they do. I guess it could be a Wisconsin thing. I don't really know. But it's really good. Um, I would urge you to do more research. Willie, I see in the chat that you're already looking it up. That's awesome. Um, keep like, look this stuff up. Find a variant that you really like. I would urge you to try the variant that I have described with passing. Um, I think that that's really entertaining. And as far as the whether you think people should have to trump or not, that's a personal taste. We'll leave that up to you. But as always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you really enjoyed this. If you want to support the show more and make more of these sorts of things happen, I would urge you to go find us on Pod Pledge or on Patreon. We have campaigns going on both those if you want to financially support the show. Otherwise, signal boosts and retweets are always appreciated uh, so we can continue to grow the channel. I'm really excited about the progress I've made here with the live streaming rig. I'm really excited about how I can maybe move forward. I'm gonna, there's more tech upgrades that are coming in the future. I've got a better camera that I'm just waiting on a couple cables so that way I can hook it up to the computer that I've got running here so that way I can do more mobile shots. Um, so that way everything isn't either my face or a top down. Um, and we'll get there at some point, just not there yet, but slowly but surely. In the meanwhile, I want to keep doing these. So uh, let me know the Cubist podcast at gmail.com if you enjoyed this. If you found this useful at all, follow us on um, Twitter at Cubist Podcast. Subscribe on the YouTube channel, please. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the little bell so that way you get notifications whenever I do one of these live streams. I'm going to try and do at least one Let's Learn. I've decided I'm just going to call them Let's Learns because why not? I'm going to try and do one Let's Learn a week in a format similar to this. I'll start doing more gamery things too, but I think I'm also going to do a lot of older games because I think I feel like everybody is covering new hotness all the time. I want to cover some classics that I think maybe get overlooked a little bit. So anyway, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope everybody had a fantastic time watching this. Thanks for hanging out with me, and we will catch you all again later. Have a good one. How do I 
to stop this. Oh, it's right there, I'll bet you. Ha ha!